Welcome back for another episode of the Happy at Work podcast with Laura, Tessa, and Michael. Each week, we have thoughtful conversations with leaders, founders, and authors about happiness at work. Tune in each Thursday for a new conversation. Enjoy the show. Welcome everyone to the Happy at Work podcast. We are so excited to have with us today, Brett Martin, who is the co-founder of Charge Ventures and Kumo Space. Welcome, Brett. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So Brett, let's just kick off with a question we ask a lot of our guests on the podcast, which is you've had um, a fantastic career journey and specifically around entrepreneurship. So can you tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and what has led you to the work that you do today? Yeah, well, I grew up in a small mid-Atlantic beach town called Ocean City, Maryland. And my first job was actually the uh, seashell trade as young children from beach towns do. And we used to go and get a bushel of dirty conch shells from a fisherman for $2 and then clean them, bleach them, and then sell them to tourists for $2 a piece. And that was a brisk trade until my parents found me paying my sister hourly, like $2 an hour to run the business. And they put an end to that. And I learned about regulation and uh, ethics. And uh, we split it ever since then. But, you know, I always been interested in, in doing my own company. I went to Dartmouth and kind of unthinkingly went back to you know, New York and did investment banking for a couple of years after that. But I knew I always wanted to start a company. And so after kind of living on a sailboat and doing a rock band and living in Italy for a while, I eventually kind of ended up you know, starting my first company, which is called Sonar, around 2010. And then, you know, I guess we've done three since then. So, you know, either been building or investing in, in, in technology you know, since college, more or less. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, what kinds of areas you're focusing on now. Yeah, well, so I am, um, you know, I have been building Charge Ventures, which is, you know, pre-seed focused, New York-based venture capital fund. We let, you know, we write 500,000, 750K checks into companies just getting off the ground. So our ideal startup to fund is, you know, two brilliant gals in an apartment in New York with a, a plan to change, gleam in their eye and a plan to change the world and maybe a, a limping along prototype. Uh, and, you know, I had been doing that for eight years, you know, investing, we're on our third fund now. And, um, and when I see a good business that has, rev, you know, growing top line and growing users and high margin and, you know, kind of virality and defensibility, and, you know, I, I usually will just give them money and say, okay, this is great. You know, send me a check in five years. It doesn't actually work like that, but it's easier to invest than it is to build. But, you know, when I saw this opportunity around Kumo Space, which is, you know, the company I co-founded with my co-founder, Yang Mao, who's an old friend of mine, we've built three companies together. I said, it was one of those things where I couldn't help but do it. I couldn't help but, I couldn't help but try to build it because it spoke to me personally. Like, I feel like the best companies are usually like extensions of the founder. They're like, take some value that the founder, you know, lives by and then tries to like bring that in, into the world. And so for Kumo Space, it's, you know, we build virtual offices where te- remote teams show up to work and collaborate together. And I felt like, wow, you know, there's no way for lots of people to hang out on the internet simultaneously at the same time and and, and connect and kind of or move organically, just like happens in an office. And I was like, this is crazy that this doesn't exist. So uh, I said, okay, I'll put the entrepreneurial hat back on and get back and get back in the arena. Gotcha. Wow, that's amazing. So I'm so curious. Well, one of the topics we focus a lot on is this idea of organizational culture. You know, how do you really create values and norms and beliefs in an organization that helps it be, you know, a thriving organization from a business results perspective, but also from, you know, a place where people feel like they thrive and they do their best work. So super curious around, you know, the work that you do as an investor or an angel investor. And when you're working with these kinds of startups and deciding to invest in them, how do you think about culture or, you know, how do you encourage the work on creating a great culture? Yeah, you know, I think culture is probably one of the few you know, durable 
uh, you know, we look, talk about moats you know, as adventure investors, right? What's going to make this a durable business, defensible business? And and I, I really do think that the culture is one of the few things that is defensible and, and, and durable. It actually starts, it originates directly with our invest, investment criteria. So, you know, we invest in pre-seed, so there's not a lot of financials or even, you know, metrics or traction or products even sometimes evaluate. So, you know, fundamentally, what are we evaluating as pre-seed investors? I mean, we're evaluating the founder. And so we we think a lot about this. We have a concept called founder market fit, which is like, why is this the right guy or girl to build this company, right? What is, you know, what unique insight do they have? Or, and, it, you know, oftentimes it's, oh, I worked in this industry for 10 years and I saw how broken it was and now I'm going to fix it, right? That, that, that's, that's a common one. But another one is, Oh, you know, my my mom got sick with, you know, cancer and I just went, you know, crazy into like the research and and figuring out, you know, maybe there's another solution. So, you know, it could tie you could be tied to the problem for a number of reasons, but you know, we try to evaluate that. And then it also is like I think there's no one size fits all, right? There's certain companies and certain opportunities where like you might want a really aggressive kind of sales focused you know, culture. And then there are other types of opportunities where like, you know, we invested in a, a new generative AI, gener- you know, generative AI design tool. So they're like building a set of new creative suite, let's say the next Adobe, but they're building it with like gen AI, generative AI at the core of it. So it's not just like sprinkle it on like pixie dust, but it's like built into the, all their workflows. And, and so for that company, right, it's like, you know, you don't really want, you don't want a sales culture. Sales people don't care what software they're building. They want to just sell it, right? This, you wanted a designer. So you want you know, someone that's like very thoughtful, very, you know, considered and measured. And, and you know, and so we invested in a guy, Grant Davis, to do that. So I think, you know, again, it's like matching the the, the culture to the, op- to the opportunity. It's really interesting to hear you talk about how you assess the the entrepreneurs have an entrepreneurial background, but I was always the hired CEO into some startups. And it wasn't until my third one did I finally figure out that, oh, culture needs to come earlier (laughs) than later, because it's kind of hard to build culture into an already established company as a hired CEO versus if you're able to kind of start it from the beginning, you can start to create processes and ways that the the teams communicate so that they can better connect with one another. So do you ever give advice to the entrepreneur that you're investing in, or do you ever talk to them about ways they can start thinking about bringing teams together or building that that way to be productive in a team format? You know, especially for people who may be really super smart in the technology side, and that's why you're investing in them, but they still have to create an organization, a company, and and get great people together to move it to move it forward. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I feel like we all need we all we all need a lot of coaching there. You know, I'm still trying to get better at it. I think one of the founder blind spots is that, like, as a founder, you become completely consumed with your problem and your company, and you know, it's like your baby, right? But then you lose track that like, it is not everyone else's baby; it is their job. And so, how do you, you know, how do you keep that in mind and be fair to these people that you know? are choosing to work with you and, you know, frame their work in ways that give them purpose and, and, you know, and, and, and meaning. So, you know, I'm just, I'm always interested in, like, you know, I feel like culture and and ritual are often quite, you know, intertied together and used together. And I'm very uh, kind of obsessed with little rituals that companies do to uh, create opportunities opportunities to illustrate uh, the culture. And so, I'll, you know, one of my earlier investments is in this company um, called Cargo, and they they run the largest kind of like advertising display network on top of um, on top of uh, ride shares. And, and uh, this guy, Jeff Kripe, who's the, the CEO, he had a really fun tradition, which was on everyone's first year, they got a pair of like Cargo you know, shoes. I can't remember they Nike or Adidas or something, but like they were very distinctive looking and they had their name on it. And it was like, I was like, oh, that's really, you know, 
that's like a cool way of doing it. I, I know Notion, I've noticed this, you know, the, the productivity software Notion, they have a little Lego, you know, figurine that like is like, you know, a caricature of the person. And then they get little pieces of Legos, you know, for ten- tenure or for accomplishment or whatever. And it's like a nice little thing sits on their desk. And so, yeah, I feel like you have to find opportunities to like, you know, reinforce like what the culture is and I, and you know you talk about Amazon like as an example of this like oh my gosh they work their 14 principles into every you know sentence or every presentation that they give I, it's just like an extreme example of that right having some those first two examples you gave having a, like a physical representation or manifestation right of something you can kind of point to and put in your hand to say oh I get it right it's pretty powerful isn't it yeah, especially in this like virtual world, you know, we sell virtual offices, we work, we're fully distributed and remote. And yet, you know, we actually have person off sites twice a year because we see the value in, you know, bringing people together. Completely, completely. We saw that you recently at the South by Southwest presented about remote work. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about remote work and whether or not you, you know, think about whether or not it's here to stay, which we I mean. <laughs> Which you hope? All right. Well, I don't know. I'm fully committed to this future. And I think the discussion around remote work is actually this false dichotomy that where it's either, okay, you can, you know, work in an office, in which case you it's good, you know, connections to your coworkers and you can collaborate, you know, you can collaborate and you're, product- you're productive, you know, but you have to commute for an hour and a half a day and you don't get to uh, you know, you, you have to sit there when no one else is there and you have to put in FaceTime and, you know, it's kind of like you can only work for companies that are, you know, co-located with you in your city, right? You have to work in a major urban area or, okay, yeah, you can work remote and so you can have the flexibility and you can work from anywhere in the world and you, you know, have more of your own schedule and you don't have to commute, but, but then, oh, wow, you're actually like isolated and, you know, you're alone and you don't have strong, don't have strong company culture, right? This, and so the world has created this, oh, either or, like it's black or white. And uh, at least, you know, I believe in, in the vision for Kumo Space, which is my company, is that like, there's a third way, right, where you can be productive, you can connect with your co- colleagues, you can, you know, get good, really high productivity work done. You can be a performance organization. You know, you can be a culture first organization and you can get that flexibility and freedom that we know uh, everyone, you know, loves. We, you know, people love being able to like drop their kids off at school. They they love being able to, you know, live like instead of taking week off and going on vacation for one week in Europe, it's like, oh, wow, now I actually can work from France for three weeks and then take the fourth week off, right? So our vision is that, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too in that in that respect. So just to kind of stay on that line around remote work, because some of the re- questions we get related to the podcast or the teaching and the research that we've done has been, how do you, how do you create you know, team performance. Of course, there's lots of, I think it's a multi-generational thing. So we recently had a, a panel of Gen, Gen Zers who were two, three years out of college, under, out of undergrad. And to them, what actually was eye-opening to us to hear was they were like, we don't know any other way. Like we've come into our professional careers being remote. So you, you know, declaring us, it's better for us to come back to work doesn't even make sense to us because we've never known a world where we weren't remote for the majority of the time, which was a huge aha for us. So to those, you know, cynics who are questioning productivity of employees or how do you track that or how do you actually build team performance and and how are you able to measure that? What are some of the things you say? And, and can you tell us a little bit more about Kumo Space and may, maybe how that collaboration works in that virtual setting that could help demonstrate some of those metrics that managers are looking for to, to make sure that when their employees are remote, that they're actually working? Yeah, well, so yeah, you hit on one of, you know, visibility, which is like sort of a core value proposition of Kumo space, but it's funny. I don't know if you read the Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon, his, you know, memo basically calling everyone back to the office, right? He says, okay, we're gonna have everyone back to the office, I think May 1st or something. And, And 
the, all the re, you know, he, he states all these reasons. He's like, oh, you, you need men, you know, mentorship, you need better collaboration. You know, he, he sort of skirts around this idea of accountability, but it's there too. Um, and it's funny because I read that, read that memo and I, and I said, yeah, I agree with literally everything he's saying. I just don't think that you need to be in a physical office to get this thing. And, and so that's the core premise of Kumo Space, which is a virtual office. You know, it's just like you open it up a screen. It's, it's a, it's a two dimensional map and, you know, you've got different offices and you'll just see people as their video, their videos, their avatar, and they're having conversations. They're screen sharing with each other and they're moving between, you know, marketing and sales, just like you would see in a real, office and you know at any given time an office has dozens of conversations going on at the same time and you know that's just what kumo space does rather than having you know everyone having their own little chat in in a, a black hole right where i might have a thousand person company there might be 50 people zooming there might be 50 different zoom conversations with five people in each of them right now at any given time and i have no idea what those are and it would also be really weird if i just like showed up in your waiting room in Zoom, uh, you know, and you're like, what's Brett doing in there? I, you know, you that would be weird, right? Whereas in Kuma Space, it's totally natural. You can see everyone. So, you know, why, uh, like, we, we, the way we frame it is that people tend to, they, they come for the culture, they, they buy for the visibility, and then they end up staying for the collaboration. And so what I mean by that is everyone knows they have a culture problem. Right. Anyone who's running a remote or hybrid organization, they know that they have a culture problem. Right. They're like, oh, man, how do we do this? How do we build strong relationships? We know that, you know, all the research says that you don't have a friend or two at your company. You're like much more likely to leave. Everyone's going to just quit their job as soon as someone offers them a dollar more. And so whether you're CEO or you're a head of, you know, head of HR or you're a remote work specialist or, you know, whose job it is, you come to Kumo Space and because uh, you know you need to solve this problem. Now, historically, people, what happened during the pandemic, what we saw is everyone said, oh, great, I'm going to have happy hour uh, once a month or once a quarter, or I'm going to have a holiday party virtually. And, you know, wouldn't that be nice if that solved my culture problem, right? Wouldn't it be great if we just dedicates 60 minutes a quarter and then we'd have an amazing culture and, you know, that's it. It works like that. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, right? Because you all know that like culture is this muscle that is built over time through observing what is rewarded and what your leaders do, right? And so, you know, I think I always think of culture as, you know, culture is what your team does when you're not in the room, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, culture is your co-founder that's always there. And um, so we we believe that culture is like this thing that is emergent property can be structured and deliberate about creating it, but it is an emergent property of those interactions. And you have to, it's the five or six or dozen micro interactions you have across the day that people learn, okay, this is how things are done here. And so we said, okay, event isn't the problem. We actually, you have, you have to live with it to fit in this virtual office. And the truth is that just like a virtual, just like a bringing, you know, people back to the physical office, there's a lot of resistance because people are like, like I, you know, given the choice between having zero accountability, like I'm always going to choose that, right? You know, that's not just employees, that's bosses too, you know, bosses don't want to have to be accountable to their employees. They they don't want to have to be on the hook to help them at any time. But so there's this like cut resistance, right? But some people know that, okay, we actually have to work together. So a lot of bosses say, I want to see what my team's doing. And, you know, I think there's a negative connotation to that. Like uh, sometimes there's like this like surveillance sort of connotation. But a lot of times there's actually positive side of it, which is like remote equity, right? Remote work equity. A lot of times remote workers have historically been second class citizens. They've been mothers who, you know, have to watch the kids. They've been, you know, people of color in disadvantaged areas that are, you know, trying to you know, get a remote job. And so those people now have equal footing to everyone else and have an opportunity to be seen by their boss, to be met, if you're a young employee, an opportunity to be mentored by your boss, right? And then the final part is, okay, so actually you're there, you can see other people. Well, guess what? If you could just see someone, you could tap them on the shoulder. And so why people end up staying using Kumo Space and you know we don't really have any churn is because, wow, you realize, yeah, if we get everyone together and we are synchronous for several hours a day, we're actually going to be much more effective, shocker, than if we're all 
sitting in our rooms by herself and occasionally doing a Zoom when we f- must. Yeah, completely. I love that description. That was awesome. So we're kind of wrapping up already. This time went by so fast. A question, kind of final question for you is, how does your personal life intersect with your work? We really talk a lot about, you know, mm integration and being whole and not being two separate people. So just curious about, so how that comes together for you. Oh, that's fun. I, uh, you know, we hear this work-life balance thing a lot. It's interesting. On one hand, Kuma space, people have been talking about how work from home breaks down work-life balance. And, um, you know, there's like a lack of boundaries the same way that there were when there, when we went to the office. And uh, I actually think Kuma space pro- brings that back because a lot of the companies that use Kumo Space, they say, hey, these are our hours, like come into the office when you're working. And then when you're not working, like you're not in the office and you're not working. And that's that's the that's the line. At least how I've chosen to deal with it. And what I do think is like where things are probably going is is not this like hard black and white. It's not a nine to five, but rather like more of a holistic integration between my work and my life. So like I like the fact that being remote means I don't have to be here at 11 a.m. on Friday. If I don't need to, I can be somewhere else. And then I can make up that work, you know, on Saturday if, if I want to. So I think work-life balance for me personally doesn't mean, it means a, a more tightly interweaving and going back and forth and reducing switching costs and, and friction. You know, as an entrepreneur though, I did learn a lesson, which is like, you can either take off when everyone else is taking off, like you can take off your holidays or you can take off whenever you want, but you can't do both because then you're just working less. So, you know, that is an important thing for entrepreneurs to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, you, you, (laughs) there's only a finite time. So I don't know that that's my personal philosophy. I'm curious to hear y'all's. No, it's, I think it's really interesting because I have colleagues who have just written an article on, on this and, they really refer to it as work-life integration and the fact that it's it's less about trying to be really boundaried and disciplined about this is my working hours and this is my life, you know, especially if you're remote, it's hard to do that. But it's it's really just allowing a little bit more fluidity and then also more authentically bringing yourself to the table when you're at work. So you're representing your whole self, you're bringing all of your different interests, your diversity of skill sets and perspectives and and that, you know, all of that, all of you comes to the table when you're, when you're working from home. So anyways, Brett, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. We would love to, first of all, I, I definitely want to jump on Kumo space because I want to check it out from my team, to be honest. It just sounds very cool, but we'd love to check back in with you in like six months to see how things are going and and what's evolved for you or any other cool startups that you're working with. Oh, it'd be my pleasure. I really, I feel like we have so much more to talk about. And if yeah, you all ever completely. pass through New York City, please let me know. I'd be happy to go grab a coffee. <laughs>